Mm, um, I can see me. No. Yeah, I can see it as well. Okay. So, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Thank you all for attending this 10th session of Frontiers in Mechanical Engineering and Sciences. It has been an exciting journey for all of us. Uh, and we are especially thankful to the leadership of uh, Professor Devesh Ranjan for instigating this wonderful initiative. So today we have, uh, so this is the team of the organizing committee team consisting of people from different universities. So today um, we have two exciting speakers. First, uh, I would leave it to the to our distinguished moderator, Professor Malse, to introduce the speakers. I will just briefly mention about the two speakers. The speakers are uh, Professor Margaret Byron from Payne State and Professor Ryan Sokol, my colleague from University of Maryland. Uh, before I give the uh, podium to Professor Malse, a few words about him. Professor Malse, uh, is R. Eugene and Susie E. Goodson, Distinguished Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue University. Uh, prior to coming to Purdue University, Professor Malse was in University of Arkansas, where he was uh, he served as Distinguished Professor and 21st Century Endowed Chair Professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Professor Malse has received numerous honors, including fellowships to the International Academy of Production Engineering, American Society of Materials, American Society of Mechanical Engineering, and the Institute of Physics. In 2018, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineers for innovations in nanomanufacturing with impact in multiple industry sectors. Professor Malse has trained more than 60 graduate and postdoctoral students, published over 200 peer reviewed manuscripts and received over 20 patents, resulting in award-winning engineered, pro engineered products applied in energy, aerospace, transportation, and EV, high-performance racing, and other industrial sectors. He serves multiple professional organizations through his leadership roles on various national and international committees, and we are sincerely grateful that he has kindly agreed to serve as a moderator of these two talks. So I would, with this, I would like to give the stage to Professor Malsa. Thank you for the generous introduction. I think it is, I'm very excited to be on the call. And this is something, a great initiative. Thank you to all the organizers. I don't want to single out anybody, but thank you for all the organizers, especially Devish, Partha, Siddharth, and my colleagues here, as well as at Georgia Tech and other places. Uh, I started my career at Ohio State, so it's good to be back with Big Ten again. So I just want to acknowledge that as well. Uh, with that, uh, really today is the day we would love to hear from Margaret Byron as well as Ryan Show. But to present the stage, I would like to share a few slides with each of you. And I'm going to open my few slides. With that, I hope uh, you can see the slides. I'm still loading. So the word conversions. Uh, can you see it? Yes, we can. Ajay. Yeah, we can. See Devish, it. You can. Thank you. So the thank you. So the word conversions is seen in many ways. It is still of in a much formulation stage, but nature of biology has been my interest as an engineer, scientist, and also as a painter. Uh, art is my very close hobby, and that's something I always found nature is quite an important area. And so it is really a source for me for really understanding convergence. So that's what I will be speaking about in a few slides. To give a backdrop, as you heard before, I think equally more important that today, my interest is biased by designs. I learned designs from nature, surface as well as smartness in manufacturing. There are multiple areas of application and entrepreneurship still is very important to me because that's where you do translational engineering. This is my past background in the area of machining, uh, various difficult to machine materials, so lubrication, corrosion, 
really studying at nanoscale. This lens scanning simulation is about 3D nanometers. And really, I wanted to cure the cancers for the mechanical machine. As people were curing cancers with nanotechnology, for human, I decided to cure, curing friction, wear, corrosion for the mechanical machines. But looking forward, uh, convergence, as I mentioned, is something that is very important to me. So years before, and I would like to acknowledge the work that I'm presenting is a result of my numerous outstanding collaborators, including my postdoctoral fellows, my students, including graduate, undergraduate, especially my, one of the postdocs recently, Dr. Salil Bapert, who is also co-author of this paper. We really looked at convergence in the lens of biology. And what we call is biologicalization. So biologicalization of materials, processes, design, systems, system of systems, we start looking at that with the multiple assets and facets. So this was one of the early publications that, but taking that theme forward, I would like to share three quick examples to set up the stage for our outstanding speakers today. First is that we asked a question in year 2010 that what is the nature of toolbox? If nature is a great manufacturer, manufacturing 8 million species, what is nature's toolbox? And we came up with about 10 different tools that nature uses to manufacture beautiful, aesthetically beautiful, as well as very highly functional and resilient component systems and system of systems. So this is the first application, and for people who are interested, I'm listing uh, references at the bottom not to spend more time. The second interest is how to turn biological uh, designs into smart manufacturing. So this is learning mechanical traction from nature, using the texture, making that a CAD models and importing that uh, into the uh, 3D printer and printing that on a stainless steel and from robots and farming tools and other applications. So how you do biologicalization of the nature, what you learn from nature. And the recent work, in fact, with my colleagues, including Professor Melkot from Georgia Tech, about understanding under resilience, because nature is a great toolbox of resilience, especially during COVID-19, a lot of systems have dysfunctional, and that's what caused a lot of stress on the society. So understanding that resilience from the nature, which is system and system of systems, means if you look at beautiful designs of dandelion, colon, as well as COVID wires, there are large similarities in these design architectures, what made it more resilient. So these are the three areas, just as a highlight of what really in the convergence and biologicalization. With that, I would really like to go to introduce today's both the speakers who are outstanding and in their own merits, what they have done and what they would be doing. So with that, first, I would like to thank to my part what I have presented, but going back to today's first speaker, Dr. Margaret Byron, uh, Margaret is multi-talented in disciplines as well as her own skills. Uh, she's graduated, an undergraduate from Princeton where she had a first introduction to the biology. Then she graduated from civil engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. And her areas of core competencies and interests are turbulence, biomechanics, environmental and fluid dynamics, by implementing and applying that to the various systems that you're looking at the current research focus area. Uh, this is an example of snapshot of her group at the same time. She's looking at the environmental, biology, and fluid mechanics, a really good example of convergence in many ways. And we all would congratulate her for two beautiful children that during the COVID-19, that she and her husband uh, conceived, and she, this is really the time she's balancing harmony between you know, family life and profession. So, Margaret, we congratulate you for this is outstanding progress what you're making. Second, we would also like to introduce another graduate from University of California at Berkeley, and now a faculty. Just like Margaret, she's a faculty at uh, Penn State. Yeah. Uh, Ryan is a very successful individual in his own. Maryland, and his interest is really a combination of biology at multiple lens scales for microfluidics, injured breast systems, and University of California at Berkeley, he has built those foundations for what is required for building 
this infrastructure and progress at Maryland. So with these, and this is a snapshot of his group, uh, as I said, that I would encourage each of you to look at their website, what they have accomplished. I, I must tell you that I'm somewhat older now, but I really would find their careers very inspiring, even as a somewhat established faculty. So with that, I would like to open the presentation and the dais to open with uh, Margaret's presentation. Margaret, if you are ready, uh, please go ahead and share your screen. I'm going to disconnect myself. Thank you again. Welcome to the podium. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to share here and I'm going to share a blank desktop first and then see if I can get this working. Okay. Um, so uh, I know it'll probably take a few minutes to load. So I just want to. It's yeah. already good? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the, the very kind introduction uh, and uh, uh, my name is Margaret Byron. I'm coming from Penn State University, where I'm an assistant professor. Uh, I started there in 2017, and I currently direct the Environmental and Biological Fluid Mechanics Lab. Uh, and in this lab, we, we like to look at questions of how animals and objects move through and are moved by turbulent fluid flow. When we think about turbulence as a, as a complex environment, as a backdrop against which all of these things happen, uh, and of course, the, the question of navigating complex terrains is not a new one for engineers and not a new one for roboticists. Um, here on the left, you can see a humanoid robot traversing a complex terrain. This is kind of a grand challenge in robotics. Uh, and often we will try to take inspiration from nature, as Professor Moshe uh, alluded to. Uh, on the right, you see uh, a wonderful example of an animal that's able to navigate complex terrains. It's a cockroach. Uh, and what's very cool about this particular study is that they found that there was no significant change in the neural feedback of this animal as it traversed rough terrain, even with roughness elements up to three times uh, its own hip height. Uh, and if we go back actually and look at uh, this, this human robot, we can see that the, the obstacles it's tra traversing are significant, but not even close to approaching three times its own hip height, right? Uh, and so I'm hoping to make the case to you today that the complexity of the terrain really depends on a relative scale uh, and that complexity is relative in terms of the environment. Uh, and what could be more complex uh, than turbulent fluid flow? Uh, and so in addition to the kind of spatial complexity that we just saw, fluid flows have temporal complexity as well. Uh, and turbulence is kind of uh, the queen of all complex environments because of the multi-scale nature of turbulence. And we have large eddies and medium eddies and small eddies all kind of superposed and influencing each other, living and dying in this complex uh, and uh, self-influencing way. Um, this is my favorite picture of the multi-scale nature of turbulence because you can really see the large scales and the medium scales and the small scales here on the left. Um, but, but animals inhabit these kinds of environments and, and traverse them quite effectively. Uh, and here we have uh, an example, this is not even turbulence, uh, just a kind of a simple perturbation of, a, of an upward gust in a wind tunnel for a hummingbird. Uh, and so you can see that the animal, as it flies through, I want you to focus on this hummingbird's head. And you can see that it is really quite remarkable in terms of maintaining orientation. And this is the first time it was exposed to the gust. Uh, and uh, on subsequent transits, it becomes uh, uh, much more able to navigate this, this significant perturbation with ease. Um, and so when we think about the broader picture of turbulence, uh, we can think about turbulence as a collection of scales, as I said, and uh, kind of a classic cartoon of turbulence here. We have the energy spectrum. So on the y-axis, we have the energy that's contained in each wave number on the x-axis. So wave number is the inverse of wavelength. We have small eddies uh, on the right and, and large eddies on the left. And so at the very largest eddies are the energy-containing scales. In the ocean, this would be the scale of the wind and tides, where energy is being injected into the flow. Um, and that energy cascades into smaller and smaller and smaller eddies. Uh, they pass energy along to one another until we reach a scale at which viscosity becomes important uh, and important enough to dissipate that energy into, into heat via friction. Uh, and so that's here on the, on the other end of the spectrum in the, in the dissipative range. But there's this whole kind of landscape or, or waterscape, what have you, in between, uh, which we call the inertial subrange, where we have a, a large range of, of eddy sizes. Uh, and there's a really diverse set of body plans and swimming strategies that occur within this inertial subrange. And so why is this important for us as engineers? Uh, and and we, we talked briefly about bio-inspired robotics and bio-inspired devices, but even uh, aside the question of whether bio-inspired design is a good idea or not, or 
um, we know that we're building robotics at smaller and smaller and smaller scales, right? And, and we have the technology, uh, just amazing things going on uh, to build robots at these small scales uh, that where we are having things become more important. So, so again, we see this question of relative complexity. How does a large animal or a large object experience turbulence uh, differently from a small animal or small object? And you can take the example of uh, the whale here on the left and say, well, turbulence matters to this whale, uh, but it doesn't matter in the same sense that it does to a plankton. A whale is going to perceive turbulence more as, as enhanced mixing or perhaps might affect the way that it, uh, it approaches feeding. Um, whereas uh, something on the other end of the spectrum, like a plankton, it might have some control over its locomotion, you know, rising and sinking velocity, et cetera, et cetera. It might have some, some small abilities to kind of jump around in the fluid, but, but by and large, it's a passive drifter, right? That's where we get the word plankton in Greek for drifter. Um, and, uh, and so we have uh, a totally different experience though for these animals in the middle. They're experiencing kind of a, 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 a range of eddies and vortices where they're alternately entra entrapped in eddies that are larger than themselves or smaller than themselves. So we have this kind of question of intermittent control, uh, intermittent um, perturbation uh, that's very different for a medium-sized animal than it would be for a large or a small animal. And when we think about robotics, especially bio-inspired robotics, which are, as I said, really remarkable. Um, and you can see uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about making robots that swim like animals and, and, uh, and, and look like animals, but we spent comparatively little time thinking about how these animals might be interacting with the flow around them in terms of a turbulent environment. Um, and uh, this is this is my absolute favorite uh, video example of uh, scale dependent complexity. Here's a, a turbulent flow feature, a vortex roll up between two opposing currents. And you can see the larger organisms navigating it kind of expertly, but the smaller organisms perhaps uh, not so much. Uh, and uh, you have these these uh, unfortunate little puffer fish that are, are are not large enough to kind of escape this this intermediate sized eddy. Um, and so this means that we need to think about this question of intermittent control of position and orientation uh, for any kind of uh, robots or devices that we might uh, be designing at this scale. Uh, and maybe a good place to look uh, is animals that have successfully uh, navigated this regime, at least more successfully than those pufferfish just did. Um, I also want to point out another way that we can think about the multi-scale nature of locomotion for uh, intermediate scales, and that's uh, thinking about the transition from inertially dominated flow to viscous dominated flow. When we think about swimming, we tend to place swimmers in one of two buckets. It's a low Reynolds number swimmer or a high Reynolds number swimmer. Um, and, uh, and so a high Reynolds number swimmer, here we have the Reynolds number all the way over on the right of the screen. Um, and uh, the Reynolds number represents the ratio of inertial to viscous forces. A high Reynolds number swimmer can leverage gliding, right? Uh, and a low Reynolds number swimmer cannot. Um, and uh, this leads to a lot of really kind of big categorical differences between how low Reynolds number swimmers approach locomotion versus high Reynolds number swimmers. Um, and when we do that, when we separate them into those two buckets, we kind of ignore this gray area where inertia and viscosity are both important. Um, and, and of course, uh, it's not like there aren't animals that exist at this range. Um, so one interesting thing that we can think about is how animals develop over their lifetime, right? If they're growing uh, through a range of regimes from the viscous dominated regime to the inertial dominated regime. And we can also think about how uh, smaller scale propulsors can produce flow that combines to propel a larger animal. Um, and so here I have some pictures of an animal that's going to feature pretty prominently in the rest of the talk. Uh, this is a tinafore or a comb jelly. Uh, and tinafores are the largest animals in the world that locomote via cilia. And so I'm having trouble getting the video to play there. There it is. Uh, but this, this animal is about a centimeter and it propels itself uh, with these metachronally coordinating rows of ciliary plates, packed arrays of cilia uh, that function as paddles. Uh, and these are, are very unusual cilia. They're very long as cilia go. These are almost a millimeter long compared to the kind of micron scale uh, where we see other organisms that use cilia. So we have these strange intermediate scale cilia that are combining to produce flows that propel a much larger animal. So we're going to use this animal as kind of a test case to study a lot of really interesting questions about the multi-scaled nature uh, and the multi-scaled complexity of locomotion. Um, so keep that in the back pocket uh, and we're going to zoom out a little bit more and say, okay, how do we address this question of multi-scalarity uh, or, or as we might call it? 
Um, we can look at it in two ways. We can look at how animals interact with their environment. And we talked about the multi-scale nature of turbulence. And then we can look at intermediate Reynolds number swimming kind of uh, for its own sake. Uh, we're gonna start with the former uh, and say, okay, how do we think about how animals uh, and objects uh, interact with turbulence uh, in this way? Um, and so uh, I'm gonna give a, a quick crash course. Um, I know there are probably some people on this call who are, are experts in turbulence and some people who uh, are, are perhaps less so, uh, but one thing we can think about, I mentioned the Kolmogorov scale is kind of the dividing line uh, where viscosity starts becoming important. Uh, and the Kolmogorov scale does another interesting thing for us, is if we zoom in really, really far uh, into our turbulent flow, if we are zooming in below the Kolmogorov scale, we're at a scale that is smaller than the Kolmogorov scale, we can approximate the velocity gradients uh, as linear. Um, and so, uh, for example, this green uh, little spheroid I've placed here on the left, uh, that spheroid, if it's below the Kolmogorov scale, it's going to experience linear shearing. Whereas the object on the right, if that object is above the Kolmogorov scale, the velocity gradients are going to be highly nonlinear along the length of the particle. Uh, and so from uh, a mathematics perspective, it's relatively easy to figure out how the green particle is going to rotate if it's subjected to this kind of velocity gradient. It's, it's much harder to predict how the blue particle is going to rotate when it's subjected to these highly nonlinear, unsteady, time-varying velocity gradients. So let's start with this case. Uh, and, uh, and I'm gonna take a look at, at some of the tools that we already have to look at uh, simply shaped spheroidal particles in turbulent flow um, and in linear shear. And thankfully, we don't have to do this ourselves. We can go all the way back to 1922 uh, to Jeffrey's kind of key paper here. Uh, and uh, I promise this is this is really the only math I'm going to throw at you. I think uh, you're getting off pretty easily for a talk about turbulence here, um, given uh, uh, given this math. Um, but uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, I'm going to put a bunch of spheroids in a computational box of turbulence uh, and say these spheroids are all smaller than the Kolmogorov scale. Uh, and so I'm going to approximate the translational motion of these spheroids as path of tracers, that is to say, X dot, the position, uh, the time derivative of the position of the spheroid is the same as the fluid velocity at that point. Uh, and for the rotation, uh, things look a little bit more complicated. Um, so here I have a kind of cartoon of how we're going to treat these spheroids. I have a unit normal vector pointing along the, the principal axis of the spheroid. And that, uh, that spheroid is going to experience some angular velocity omega. So what we're going to do is we're going to prescribe the angular velocity as a combination of the fluid rotation at that point, at that time, plus a contribution from the fluid strain, right? And those are those, uh, those linear velocity gradients that I was talking about. So at a point, we know all the velocity gradients at the point, and depending on the aspect ratio of this uh, particle, that strain uh, is going to affect the, parcel's rotation, the particle's rotation a little bit differently. So we have a shape parameter where alpha here is the particle's aspect ratio. A rod-like spheroid would have a very large alpha. A disc-like spheroid would have a very small alpha. And a sphere would have an alpha of one. Um, and so this is our expression for the fluid rotation. Uh, and uh, given all this information, we can place a bunch of uh, computational particles into our computational box of turbulence and watch them move around. Um, one more uh, kind of terminology that I want to point out, uh, and this is perhaps easier if you have something that is rod shaped near you like this pen, um, you can say, okay, if I have this rod and it's kind of moving through a turbulent flow and rotating, I can express its angular velocity as the sum of two things. One, how it's spinning around its own principal axis or its axis of symmetry, and two, how it's tumbling normal to its own principal axis, right? So we can separate the total angular velocity into a tumbling versus a spinning, okay? Uh, so keep it in mind uh, as we kind of look at what we found, right? So we put a bunch of spheroids with many different aspect ratios into this computational box of turbulence uh, and, uh, and found something quite interesting, which is to say that Despite major changes in aspect ratio, the total magnitude of the angular velocity remained the same. Uh, and so that's quite interesting that a rod and a disc exhibit the same uh, angular velocity or the same magnitude of the angular velocity. But when we started looking at how that angular velocity was distributed between the particle's principal axes, we got a little bit of a different picture. Uh, and we noticed that rods over here on the right-hand side of the alpha space 
experience more spinning than tumbling, right? As that rod is, is translating through uh, the turbulent flow field, it's experiencing some tumbling, but it's experiencing more spinning. Uh, whereas a disc-like particle is experiencing almost entirely tumbling and very little spinning. Uh, and so that was quite interesting. Uh, and we, we did the same numerical experiment in a different flow, a non-turbulent but still random flow. And so this random flow had the same correlation length scale and the same correlation time scale as our turbulent flow, uh, but did not have those kind of long-lived coherent vortex structures that are characteristic of turbulence. Uh, and we did not observe this breakdown between some tumbling and spinning, and we did not observe rotation being constant across the entire alpha space. Uh, and so why is this so? Why does this happen? Uh, and this happens because of the alignment of the particle with those long-lived vortex structure. Um, so in a turbulent flow, we have uh, the um, eigenvectors of the strain rate tensor, uh, which represent the extensional and compressive strain rates here, uh, uh, and the directions of the principal strains. Uh, those tend to align with the fluid vorticity, and those in turn tend to wrench our non-spherical particles into alignment. Okay, so the longest axis of any non-spherical particle is going to tend to align itself with the fluid vorticity. Now, in our random flow, we're not really going to see a signature of this very much because those vortex structures are not long-lived. Uh, but in our turbulent flow, we have this kind of organized coherent chaos uh, where our rod-like particle, if its long axis aligns with the vorticity vector, we're going to see quite a lot of spinning, right? Uh, and if our disk-like particle has its long axis, there's not really a clear long axis defined for a disk, right? Any uh, any uh, um, diameter that I draw normal to that uh, uh, axis of symmetry will serve as a long axis, and so we'll see quite a lot of flipping and, and spinning. The vorticity vector itself will be kind of flipping the disk around quite a lot, and we'll see a lot of tumbling. Um, and so at this point, it's probably appropriate to stop and say, wait, wait a minute, we started talking about animals. How on earth did we get here? How did we get to talking about these, these hypothetical tiny rods and tiny disks and turbulence? Why does that matter? Uh, and it matters because of these guys. Um, and so uh, these are uh, diatoms, and they're, they're the smallest plankton, they're phytoplankton, uh, and, and uh, diatoms are uh, the base of the ocean food chain. Uh, they also are pro producers of the vast majority of oxygen in the atmosphere, right? so about 60% of the oxygen in the atmosphere is produced by uh, these, these phytoplankton, and uh, they have uh, rod-like and disc-like shapes um, for, for much of the, many of the species that we see. Uh, and so when we think about how these uh, rod-like, disc-like uh, organisms uh, might respond to turbulent flow, uh, then their shape is pretty key in how we might think about this. So the rotation uh, might control something like the diffusive boundary layer that leads to nutrient uptake, uh, or it might, uh, it might drive the diatom to form chains. Many diatomic species can form chains and effectively increase their aspect ratio, which might again lead to uh, changes in mass transport in terms of the sinking uh, velocity of these diatoms uh, and so on and so forth. So these kinds of dynamics uh, can kind of propagate and, and uh, become important, even though it's a pretty simple physical experiment. Um, so we can apply these conclusions broadly to uh, to these, these tiny plankton. Um, I have some of our conclusions kind of up up here, uh, along with some, some really beautiful um, microscopy and, and uh, SEM images of, of diatoms. Um, and so what about larger animals, right? We said we wanted to know about what happens to animals that are navigating these intermediate scales. Uh, and so I'm going to return to our friends, the tenophores, uh, and say these are, these are a classic example of nectoplankton. Uh, and so these are, many people have heard of plankton. A uh, few people have heard of nectin, right? Nectin is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. If plankton directly translates to drifter or wanderer from the Greek, nectin translates to swimmer. Uh, but there are many animals that are neither strictly plankton nor strictly nectin. Uh, they may change from a drifter to a swimmer depending on the context. So you see this tenophore drifting into the center of the view. Uh, this particular species is an ambush predator. It has sticky tentacles that it sets out and it kind of drifts until it catches a piece of prey uh, and then it kind of can, can go off and, uh, and munch. Um, and so 
Uh, what's really interesting to me, again, these are the largest animals in the world that locomote via cilia. So it's a relatively simple, almost primitive propulsion system that's primarily used at very low Reynolds number. And yet in this context, uh, it's capable of producing pretty remarkable agility. On the right, you see the centers of mass of these animals uh, tracked as they move through the flow, and, and most of them are kind of passively drifting in this current. It's a, it's a small section of a, a circular current, which is why you see curves in the tracks. Um, but you can see these small turning radii uh, and then very short stopping distances. And in other words, almost exactly the kind of properties you could look for in, say, uh, an uh, underwater vehicle. Uh, and so this naturally kind of piques our curiosity as engineers, not just how can we understand this very interesting biological system, but what inspiration might we take from it in order to build uh, more effective devices, vehicles, sensors, et cetera. Um, and so uh, I teamed up with a, a real crack team of aquarists at the Monterey Aquarium, uh, which is an absolutely wonderful place uh, and uh, one of the world leaders in jelly husbandry. And, uh, and uh, so they are um, really know quite a lot about the biology of these animals. And we placed uh, a bunch of these teen fours into a chrysal tank. Uh, and that's kind of the aquarium standard for gelatinous animals. Uh, gelatinous open ocean animals don't tend to like corners a whole lot. They don't have eyes and they don't have brains, so they can't back out of corners. Uh, and so when they're kept in an aquarium setting, they kind of need a, a continuous flow to be resuspended. Uh, so here we have a simultaneous 3D view of uh, uh, the same tank where we're, we're focusing three cameras at once uh, so that we can get three-dimensional tracking information of the animals as they drift here up uh, on the site as a spray bar. And that's kind of injecting water uh, and producing this very slow circular flow. Um, and we, uh, we characterize this flow uh, with some rough particle image velocity symmetry. Um, it's hard to work at an aquarium, but uh, we got enough information to figure out that we could have kind of three categorically different levels of shear for this flow. We have a very slow flow, a faster flow, and, an, and a very fast flow. Uh, and we were able to inject fluorescent uh, tracer beads into these animals so that we could easily track them later on from our, uh, our high resolution footage. Okay, so we're, we're tracking the position of these animals over time as we increase the flow rate in this very simple shear flow. Um, and what we found was kind of interesting. I'm going to draw your attention to the plot from the left, uh, and that's a kind of a map of all of the animal trajectories over a 10 minute period. Uh, and you can see that in the very low level of shear, uh, the animals occupied the whole space. Uh, they were they were drifting sometimes, but they were also transiting through the center of the tank, uh, and they were they were actively swimming and passively drifting kind of to their heart's content. Uh, but as the flow increases from the blue level to the black level, which is the fastest flow, uh, you can see that they're kind of getting pushed out to the sides. And this is consistent with the animals losing control over their position. Uh, this is exactly how passive spheres would behave, kind of getting shoved out to the edges of our, uh, our circular flow. Um, but what's really interesting is that because we placed two markers in every animal, we could measure the orientation of the animal. Um, in, in, in our flows. Uh, and tenophores do have the ability to sense gravity. They have an organ called a statusis, which allows them to, to tell up from down. Uh, and uh, in our very slow flow, you can see that they spent a lot of time in the up orientation, not all their time, uh, but more than they spent in the down orientation. Uh, whereas as we increase the flow, here's our, our medium flow and then our very fast flow, you can see that they, they kind of shift from being preferentially up to having a slight preference for pointing down. Um, and if you think about the natural habitat of these critters, um, you can see that uh, they're, um, if they were in the wild, a downward pointing orientation would allow them to exit that messy turbulent upper mix layer uh, and escape into the calm depth below. Uh, so this is uh, perhaps evidence of a turbulence avoiding behavior. Um, and we actually have some more evidence of turbulence avoidance here. Uh, we measured a different like a speaker-driven turbulence tank with no mean flow, uh, we can see a change in the vertical distribution of the animals uh, between a still condition and a turbulent condition. And we can also see a change in the character of the transits through the center of the tank. Uh, and we can quantify these changes and, and uh, define kind of um, when the animal is active, when it has uh, kind of an excursion through the center of the tank, uh, how often does that happen? Uh, and how long does it happen for? And we can see that the number of excursions increased dramatically uh, over that 10 minute period uh, from the spill to the turbulent condition. And, and those transits on average were shorter. Um, and you can see also the kind of directionality of the, of the transits through the center uh, change. Um, and so I wanna move on because I only have a few minutes to talk about 
um, the second thrust here um, of our research program, we have uh, looking at the question of how animals locomote at intermediate Reynolds numbers when the propulsor itself is, is working at an intermediate Reynolds number. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that for the few minutes that I have left. Uh, and uh, we talked about spatial asymmetry, um, and uh, this is coming, drawing back to the scallop theorem. Uh, uh, if I have a hinged body here, I can hopefully you can see, um, if I am in a low Reynolds number flow, right, then if I open the scallop, I move, and I close the scallop, right, I move exactly opposite, right? I, I need asymmetry to have net fluid displacement um, in, a, in, a, in a low Reynolds number flow because of the time reversibility of the flow. Uh, and I have a video here of, uh, of an actual scallop swimming, uh, and you can see that it is, is indeed uh, a quite uh, asymmetric swimmer. It's got kind of a funny little gait there. Um, and a classic, classic example of low Reynolds number propulsors here with very uh, high asymmetry are the cilium here uh, and the flagellum here. Uh, and I noticed this paper here, and I wanted to give a shout out to uh, the team here at Georgia Tech. Um, and I'm not sure if they're on the call or not, but I'm, I'm really excited to dig into this paper. I just found it last night. It came out about a week and a half ago of artificial cilia that are actuated using external magnetic uh, current. Um, and so these are uh, low or low-ish Reynolds number systems where uh, asymmetry is necessary to produce net fluid displacement. But re recall that our tenophores are using cilia at kind of much larger scales uh, at Reynolds number of around uh, perhaps one to 50, um, let's say. Uh, and so at these scales, that idea of spatial asymmetry is a little bit less important. Um, and uh, we can also think about temporal asymmetry in a way that we couldn't in the laminar in the totally time reversible regime. For the scallop, right, it doesn't matter how fast it opens and closes. It doesn't matter if it opens faster than it closes because that doesn't factor into the fluid displacement. But the cilium, right, if we have uh, a faster power stroke versus a recovery stroke, then perhaps that matters because now we're getting up into the inertial regime. So we can think about two forms of asymmetry, spatial asymmetry and temporal asymmetry. Uh, and this is the work of my PhD student, Adrian, uh, and, uh, and he's working with particle shadow velocity symmetry, um, which is a very cool technique that I can talk about more later if there are questions. Uh, but he's defining kind of the spatial asymmetry here uh, as the, um, the actual path trace out by the tip of the cilium as it moves. Uh, and looking at that area, uh, the ratio of that area to the maximum possible uh, uh, area that the tip velocity could, uh, could traverse. Uh, so we have a uh, uh, value of one would indicate an extremely asymmetric uh, stroke and a value closer to zero would indicate a more symmetric stroke. Um, and so we can also define a temporal asymmetry where we just simply divide our beat into a power stroke and a recovery stroke and the uh, time asymmetry we define as the portion of the beat that is devoted to the recovery. Um, so if it was a very, very fast power stroke and a very slow recovery stroke, that would be a very asymmetric stroke. Uh, and if it was half-half, uh, uh, that would be a, a temporal asymmetry of about 0.5. Um, and so what we find uh, is very interesting and, and kind of physically consistent with what we might expect, which is that at Reynolds, as Reynolds number increases, spatial asymmetry decreases, right? Uh, because that idea of spatial asymmetry becomes less and less important as we get into the inertial regime. Um, but temporal asymmetry kind of weakly increases as Reynolds number increases. Uh, and here we're defining Reynolds number uh, as the team-based Reynolds number with the tip velocity uh, as our velocity scale and the team length as our length scale. Um, and so uh, this is really interesting. And uh, working with animals is hard, uh, which is why there are so few data points here. Here the filled circles are uh, the average uh, of each quantity per animal, uh, and the kind of lighter crosses are each team, each beat of each team uh, that we've digitized. Um, but uh, but there's quite a lot more uh, work to be done here, and uh, but we're very excited about what we found so far. Um, there's also quite a lot of work to be done in terms of how uh, the whole body locomotion is affected uh, by changes in the coordination of these ciliary plates, right? For example, how, how do the two rows of cilia on opposite sides of the animal coordinate to produce a turn? Uh, and so uh, this is a, a project that we're pursuing with David Murphy at the University of South Florida and Amy Moss over at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences, which is where these data were collected. 
uh, and uh, uh, we're, we're excited to kind of unpack that further, but uh, we don't have that to show you today. Um, and so this is this is basically all I've got for you today because I'm out of time. Uh, but I hope that I've convinced you that the relative scale uh, is something we should be thinking about in terms of locomotion, uh, both for for animals and as we kind of seek to build robots and devices that are that are immersed in these complicated fluid environments. Uh, and uh, and we need to think about uh, this idea of multiscalarity uh, from many perspectives. Uh, and so with that, uh, I will uh, say my thanks and uh, and uh, take any questions if there are any. Margaret, we will hold on the question until okay. Ryan is Excellent. done. Okay. And, but if uh, somebody has a question for you, they can type it in the chat. Uh, Ryan, okay. you can share your screen. Thank you. I think I might need to stop sharing. There it is. Okay. Uh, is everyone able to see that? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so, hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Sokol, and uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Maryland College Park. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, Molotia ex machina, which uh, loosely translates to flexibility from the machine, uh, which hopefully you'll see kind of there's like two concepts to that. Um, but overall, uh, my research today focuses on using uh, sub millimeter scale and sub micron additive manufacturing uh, to build soft robots with integrated fluidic cir uh, circuitry. So from a historical perspective, uh, I would argue that uh, robotics, uh, both in the research community, but then also uh, in the general public, has revolved around rigid body systems. Uh, so these are uh, basically built from hard materials that are typically actuated using electronic means. So electronic circuitry uh, for autonomous control and then also for actuation. Uh, but recently there's been a uh, shift towards the field of, of soft robotics. And the idea here is to replace the hard body systems with those that are soft body. So using flexible or compliant materials uh, could th that can then be actuated using fluidic means, such as hydraulics or pneumatics. And these provide a number of benefits compared to their hard body counterparts, particularly in terms of the adaptability of some of these components, and then also in terms of safety. And so this is actually in many ways a pretty new field. And so there's been a lot of development over the last decade. And so it started with uh, sort of kind of cute demonstrations, uh, like this example from science was a camouflage walking robot uh, where it would change color in different situations. Uh, this is an interesting example. This is someone who suffers from ALS. Uh, and so we're using a soft robotic glove uh, to help her with certain types of tasks. And this is another example where basically we have a heart that is ailing. And so we have a soft robotic heart sleeve that is trying to pump the heart in a way that is biomimetic and continuing to see more and more different types of applications related to these soft robotics. Uh, and so one of the challenges that you'll typically see uh, is related to these uh, many control inputs that you'll kind of see in all those videos, just at the edge, you'll see all of these different tubes sticking out of the soft robots. And <clears throat> And so the reason for this is because traditionally every single uh, independent actuator or different degrees of freedom for each actuator require an independent control. So if you have five fingers that even need to move like this, you're gonna need five different uh, sets of tubing connected to those. And if you want more degrees of freedom, you need to increase that even further. And so similar to how the traditional field of robotics turned to integrated uh, circuitry, to kind of overcome these kind of challenges and lead towards enhancements in portability, there is an analog in the form of fluidic circuitry for soft robotics. And so this is uh, one of my all-time favorite papers. And so this was uh, published by uh, a group up at Harvard, or actually several groups up at Harvard and a few from Cornell working together. Um, and the idea here was to take an integrated fluidic circuit, specifically an integrated microfluidic circuit, and embed it directly inside of a soft robot 
so that the robot can move autonomously without any external control. And so uh, this was, in my opinion, a really amazing development, um, but there are a number of challenges associated with this moving forward. And so from my view, uh, one of the big challenges is just in terms of the way in which the microfluidic circuit itself is manufactured. Uh, but then not just that, but even after you have the microfluidic circuit, being able to actually integrate it with the rest of the soft robotic system is another challenge. And so to give some idea of, of you know, why I think that's such a challenge. So uh, when I was a PhD student uh, back in the Berkeley Center and Actuator Center, uh, most of my life revolved around multi-layer of soft lithography. And these are some things that I personally did not in, enjoy about it. So, um, you know, because I was doing it personally, uh, the time and the labor, uh, but also the cost, um, these were all things that were uh, not fantastic. Another one was that to even start, um, it took quite a bit of technical training for me to even begin building anything. And then I needed access to the microfabrication facilities to be able to build these kind of things. Um, but then there are other challenges. So one is that if you have many different layers, one on top of another, uh, these need to be aligned to one another. And as a result, there's a bit of user skill involved in building these kind of systems, which leads to quite a bit of repeatability, at least in my case, uh, quite a bit of repeatability issues from one device to the next. Uh, and then there's an inherent issue in terms of the fact that these processes need to be moldable. And so as a result, geometrically, we're limited to these moldable rectangular monoliths. So these are all basically issues associated with conventional means of microfluidic circuit fabrication. But even if you've accomplished this, then being able to integrate it into the soft robot is a bit of a challenge. So in this case, there were a number of molds and they take these uh, microfluidic chips and put them inside the molds. Uh, they then cover it with this uh, silicone matrix and they cure it. Um, but before they cure it, they actually do this 3D printing step where they're 3D printing a sacrificial support material uh, directly inside of the matrix. And they're printing the channels, they're printing the bladders and all the connections. And then afterwards, they're gonna evacuate the support material so that what's left behind are hollow channels. This is a pretty challenging process to execute. And so one of the things that I and my group are interested in is the idea of using additive manufacturing at smaller scales uh, to be able to build these kind of soft robotic systems and provide advantages, not only in terms of building the soft robotics themselves, but also the way in which the fluidic circuitry can be fabricated and integrated with these systems. So this is the logo for my lab, and it's meant to represent uh, kind of the holy trinity of 3D printing technologies that are relevant at sub-millimeter scales. And so there are light-based approaches, there are extrusion-based approaches, and there are inkjet-based approaches. Among these, arguably extrusion-based 3D printing is, is the most popular one. If um, you were to ask someone in the general public, you know, they, if you talk about 3D printing, what do they think about? It's probably gonna look something like this. Uh, and my lab does a, a little bit of work um, in this area. And the reason for that is because I would argue that the material versatility afforded by nozzle or extrusion-based methods uh, is better than, than any other type of 3D printing process that we use in my group. Um, and so that part is, is great. The problem though, uh, firstly, is in terms of the print speed. Uh, for the types of 3D printing that we use in my lab, this is the slowest by far. It's not even comparable. It's incredibly slow. And the other part that's an even more important challenge is the limited geometric versatility. And so as we get to making, as we try to make smaller and smaller structures, this type of approach, the fact that you would need to have the, the nozzle tip directly in position, putting down material point by point, layer by layer, is going to simply just have major limitations in terms of the types of structures that one can build at smaller scales. And so as a result, we focus on two alternative technologies. And so one of the major ones is a light-based technology referred to as direct laser, laser writing. And so this is a two-photon or multi-photon approach. And the general way that this works is that we use a tightly focused uh, pulsed infrared laser. And we are focusing it within a photocurable material. It's a material that reacts to light. So it's originally a liquid, but then if you uh, are able to focus that point, uh, at the particular focal point, it's able to induce uh, photopolymerization and cause the material to cure. And so wherever you're basically scanning that focal point, you can build structures. 
And the major benefit of this technology is that the feature resolution is on the order of the 100 nanometer range. And so uh, my group has basically focused on a particular technology called in situ direct laser writing. This is something that, that my students developed. And originally this was developed in order to build organ on a chip systems. And so the concept here is that basically the 3D printing technology is fantastic in terms of building small structures. But what if you need to actually plug a physical, just a macro scale uh, tubing port into it to be able to deliver fluids? Uh, it is pretty much terrible for that. So printing in the, in the micro to even millimeter scale is okay, but if we start talking about centimeter, it's not great. And the idea was to 3D print complex microstructures directly inside of enclosed microchannels. And so this is an example uh, that we recently published just showing something that was relevant to uh, micro vessels in the body. And so here you're seeing that the inside uh, diameter of, this, of these uh, microfluidic tubes are on the order of, it's actually a little bit less than 10 microns, and yet they're fluidically stable. And so while we are currently still using this for organ on a chip technologies, particularly the kidney and the human gut, we realize that maybe it might provide utility in terms of being able to build a new generation of microfluidic circuitry that benefit from this 3D versatility at small scales. Uh, and also maybe it could be used for soft micro robotics and potentially provide a route to be able to integrate the two with one another. And so I'm gonna show you kind of the process for how this is done. And so first we're actually using this approach to 3D print the mold that we're gonna be using. So that's what you see on the right side. This is what the printing process looks like is it breaks this larger structure up and then it prints the different sections where it needs to. And then after this, we are going to, uh, in this example, we're using COP and we are gonna be uh, thermally uh, embossing it. And then afterwards, we then uh, bond the COP to another thin layer of COP to make a completely enclosed microfluidic device. And so the critical part of this process comes next, and that's where we're actually taking some type of photocurable material that's in liquid phase, and we're infusing it into the channel right here. So this is those micro channel. Um, and what we're doing is basically we're using the laser to photocure the material point by point, layer by layer, directly inside of the micro channel. Uh, and then as a result, you're able to cure the material in particular locations. And so this is kind of what the process looks like. And then once you're finished, you can remove it. And now you have some type of part that has this complex structure at, at particularly small scales. And so this is an example of one of the ones that we did in that work. Uh, this is a type of fluidic transistor. And uh, one of the things you might notice is, is in the bottom in the SEM image, the bellow structure, the thickness of those balls is less than one micro. And so that kind of gives a sense of, of the capabilities of this technology. And so and this is basically how this is functioning. And so this is a normally open microfluidic tr transistor, which is kind of the standard in, in microfluidic circuitry, where it's open, but then you can apply a pressure to close it. Um, that's kind of the easiest one uh, to do in, in most cases. Uh, we also did an example of a uh, kind of a helical spring diode. So basically, this is just a, a check valve. And so on the top, you can see there's an example of um, fluid moving through uh, in the forward direction. And so you can see that both sides kind of can actuate. And in the bottom, it's moving in the opposite direction um, and preventing fluid from that, from that direction. And so one of the things that uh, several of my students have been working on next is one, uh, developing a different type of microfluidic transistor that is normally closed. And then two, integrating it with soft actuators. And so I'm gonna show that process. And so um, this work is currently unpublished, we're submitting it, um, but uh, just note that a lot of the material today is, is currently unpublished. Um, so basically the idea is to get something that looks like this. So the outer boundary is the microfluidic system itself and those blue components are all printed directly inside of the microchannels. So we have two sets of uh, soft actuators and so these are supposed to be micro grippers. And then we also have uh, two distinct normally closed 3D microfluidic transistors. And so if you were to zoom into the cross section of this, this is the architecture that we're building in this case. And there's kind of three major components. One is that we're actually able to print free floating structures using this process. You can print this right where it is. And this is a free floating ceiling disc. Um, and geometrically it's, it's kept in place um, as you can see from the top view. 
Then we also have these, these bellows for this microstructure here to allow this part to be expandable. And then we have a micro post uh, located centrally on the top portion of the bellows. And so initially when there's a, a source pressure, it ends up autonomously uh, forcing the sealing disc down to block fluid flow. But if you apply a gate pressure of sufficient magnitude, you're able to expand the bellows to allow the source uh, fluid to be able to move from the source to the drain. And the other thing that's interesting about this is that the diameter of the disc, as well as other components, you could have a, a number of additional bellows, you could uh, vary the diameter of the bellows. Um, but the example that we're using today is that we just changed the diameter of the disc. And in doing so, we can change how much pressure is needed to actually activate the gate to allow fluid to move. And so the idea behind this is that initially we have a source pressure that's feeding into both of these uh, two components. And because of the structure, fluid is not allowed to pass. But if we apply a low gate pressure, it is sufficient to be able to open this first one and actuate the first set of grippers. But if we increase it even further, what we can do here is be able to open the second one. And as a result, we now have the actuation of both sets of grippers. So this is just an example, um, really more of a proof of concept for this kind of con um, approach moving forward. And so this is what the fabrication process looks like. Um, I know there's quite a bit of lag, but hopefully it, it shows uh, decently. Um, and so these are sped up quite a bit. You know, everything is on the order of about uh, 10 to 20 minutes, depending on the type of component that we're making. Um, and the entire system usually is done on the order of about an hour. And so this is an SEM image, a false colored SEM that shows what the micro grippers look like um, in close up. But again, just an example of, of the resolution that is enabled by the strategy. Um, and so what we did was we actually tried to, to execute this for real. And so uh, what you're seeing is basically an analogous circuit model for the structures that we have here. And we have two different diameters of, the, of that top disc that will result in differences in actuation. So initially we have that, that source pressure that I mentioned, and then we're gonna apply a low gate pressure. And then because of it, it's able to activate this particular uh, transistor to allow the top, the first set of grippers to close. And then we can continue with this process. And as a result, we can then have the second set of grippers uh, be activated. And so showing the way that this process could be executed. And so we're currently kind of working on areas related to this direction. So one of the challenges with that approach is that yes, we are fabricating the uh, soft robotic components and we are fabricating the microfluidic circuitry and they are integrated, but the outer microfluidic system is uh, the, the, those, the basic microchannels. They are manufactured using relatively conventional methods. And so one of the questions we ask is, is there a way to actually make the entire robotic system? Uh, so every single thing that, that you just saw uh, with all of the fluidic integrated, um, integrated circuitry, with all of the fluidic networks and connections in a single print run. And so to do this, we have to use a, a different technology. And specifically, it's an inkjet-based approach called polyjet 3D printing. And so this approach is more of a line-by-line, -line, layer by layer process. And this is somewhat similar to a color printer, just printing one page on top of another, on top of another, and the benefit here is that you can have a sacrificial support material printed in parallel, as well as multiple materials. And so the one that we use can print up to three different materials, as well as the support material at the same time, which can be water dissolvable to remove it afterwards. And so previously, uh, when I was a postdoc, we had, we had developed a technology where we applied this to make a number of microfluidic operators. So we made microfluidic uh, capacitors, we made microfluidic diodes that could allow flow to move in one direction, but prevent them from moving in another direction, as well as transistors. And I'll talk a little bit more about transistors in a bit. Um, but the inherent disadvantage of this initial approach was that everything was made of a single material. And so that meant that if we had basically parts that are meant to be dynamic and part that are, parts that are meant to be static, unfortunately, they're all the same material. And that is not a really great way to design something. And so it would be much better if the dynamic parts were made of a flexible material and the static parts are rigid material. And so that's what we've been working on lately. So these are um, 
a number of students who have uh, done this, this current work. And the idea here is that we use a rigid material for the outer casing. We then actually 3D print a sealing O-ring that's made of a flexible material. We have a rigid piston that is used to connect these two flexible diaphragms to one another. And the way that this works is that initially we have this source flow, uh, kind of like we did before, that moves from the source to the drain. Uh, and then we have a gate pressure. And so this ends up actually forcing a, a force balance on the piston in the center. And so that's gonna be related to the pressure times the area of those diaphragms. And so one of the benefits is that we can design this such that the area of the source to drain region is going to be smaller than the area of the gate region. And as a result, even if the gate pressure is smaller than the source pressure, it's able to overcome it and still be able to stop that fluid flow. And this process is referred to as gain, the idea of a smaller input overcoming a larger input. And so these are three different designs that we uh, fabricated and we tested. So these are some experimental results as well. And so what you'll see is that initially, the one with the largest gate diaphragm, so the top section is identical, but the bottom gate diaphragm is able to close first at a relatively low pressure. And then you can keep increasing that gate pressure a bit further until finally the middle one uh, is able to close at a medium pressure. And then of course, you can continue on this process depending on the particular geometry. And we used a control where the top and the bottom were identical. And this required a relatively high pressure to be able to close them. So then we integrated this with 3D printed soft actuator. So we printed this entire thing together. And the idea here is that initially the source pressure moves from the source to actually an output exhaust. But if you apply a gate pressure of sufficient magnitude, you're able to actuate the transistor so that the source pressure has nowhere left to move, but into the actual uh, uh, soft diaphragms itself. And so here you can see what this looks like in real life. And so in the back, you're able to see um, this is a little chem wipe just to show what's happening with the exhaust. And what you'll see is that as we increase the gate pressure, uh, one, you're gonna see some deformation in terms of the, uh, the soft finger bending. And two, what you're gonna see is that the chem wipe stops blowing as much. And so one of the things you can do here is you can also quantify how much force um, is the finger being able to uh, achieve based on some of these different conditions. And so let's say that you wanted to have a force of 100 uh, millinewtons. What you find is that distinct pressures result in different amounts of force, depending on the type of transistor that's been integrated with the component. So we took this a little bit step further and what we did was we integrated everything into a soft robotic hand. And so it looks like this. And we decided we were gonna use it to play Nintendo. And so initially the gate pressure is off. And so nothing's happening. None of the buttons are being pressed. If you use a low pressure, it is sufficient to be able to actuate the particular finger that's connected to the D-pad. And so now Mario is able to move forward if you're playing Mario. Second is a medium pressure. And now Mario starts to run. And then finally with a high pressure, he can jump. And so we move forward and we fabricated this. And so this is showing the entire you know, fabrication process in terms of the single print one. Uh, this was executed in less than in less than four hours, and it was done so autonomously, right? So we send the file in, and then they tell us, hey, it's it's done printing, and then we pick it up. Uh, the one challenge is you do have to remove the support material that's around it and fill it into the channels. But after doing so, you end up with something like this. And so I'm going to show a demonstration that we did with this particular component. And so what you'll see is basically this part is we try to get everything in the same frame during this. So we have uh, the pressures that are being applied to the different components. We have a source pressure that's gonna be held constant. We have a gate pressure that is going to be the only thing that we're gonna be adjusting during this process. And you'll be able to watch as the fingers inflate and deflate, but we did fix them in place because we didn't want them moving laterally. We want them only moving straight down. And then you'll be able to watch how Mario moves during this process.
So there were a few challenges in, in terms of this process. Uh, the main one, honestly, was um, that there's a bit of a delay in terms of um, the fingers actually actuating the way that you want them to. And that's because they do behave somewhat like a capacitor in terms of there's going to be a time lag associated with the amount of inflation that's needed. Uh, and so we saw that for other cases, too, where there's this lag in terms of being able to press a button. Um, and even for uh, jumping routines like this, that was pretty difficult to execute to get it to basically to press down, deflate, and then inflate again. Uh, but we were able to make it so that we were able to use this process to fully be able to uh, beat the first level of the market. So in conclusion, we demonstrated two different approaches today uh, for soft robotics and integrated circuitry fabrication and integration. And so the first used our in-situ direct laser writing process uh, to be able to create uh, two sets of soft robotic grippers uh, that were able to be controlled at different gate regulation pressures uh, based on the way in which we designed them geometrically. And then we also demonstrate the use of polyjet 3D printing and inkjet-based technology to be able to print an entire soft robotic hand uh, with all of the fully integrated microfluidic circuitry, as well as the fluidic networks and exhaust ports and everything in a single print run. And then we use that to demonstrate that we could do, uh, that we could be able to beat Mario Brothers in real time, uh, at least for the first level, uh, using just a single gate pressure input that there is. And so with that, I wanna thank um, all of our funding sponsors. And so the particular research that you saw today was funded by uh, NSF, uh, CECD and uh, ARL. Uh, but then also all the other funding or, uh, sponsors for the rest of our lab that also kind of relates to these technologies and especially Terrapin Works, uh, who handled all the actual 3D printing, um, at least for the inkjet based approaches, but um, we use their facilities for all of our 3D printing resources. And so with that, um, I feel comfortable opening up the floor for questions. Ajay, you are on mute. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you, Irish. So thank you again, uh, Ryan and Margaret, for excellent presentations. A lot of a lot of new ideas and a lot of questions and answers, partly. So with that being said, uh, floor is open for any questions. I have I have quite many questions, but I'm going to hold all questions behind. It is really about audience. Go ahead, please. If I hear a long silence, especially on Friday evening, that is not a good idea. So, <laughs> uh, any questions, please? We're always, who could be the first one in the challenge, right? So let me be the first one, put my neck out there. So, Margaret, I have one question for you that as you're studying, if I may call flagellum, because I worked in my past with E. coli cells, and E. coli cells have flagella, uh, those are used there, but also they're connected by nanomotor, flagellar motors. So, do you see, a, how do you see the role of those quote unquote uh, routine electrical devices along with the flagellum? because you have really across the level control at nanoscale as well as micro and mesoscale. So that becomes a very interesting problem of control and fluidics. So that is a question for you. Uh, so with that, and Ryan, I have excellent work. I have just quite many thoughts. So uh, one question for you is that, can you apply this technique for a food application? Food is something important, very close to everybody and uh, that there could be a whole application area in the food that might be of interest because that is a very heterogeneous material system. With that, I uh, would be the first one. Uh, these are not the question necessary, but these are all the parts. But go ahead if you would like to share reflections. Uh, Margaret, do you want to go first? Sure, yeah. So um, I think the idea of kind of the multi-scaled nature of things in the abstract shows up over and over and over again in engineering. Um, and I was actually just talking to, to Mark about that in the private chat. Um, and so in, in terms of the control architecture, I actually think this is kind of a good question uh, for Ryan, who's presenting some of the coolest, just the coolest stuff here uh, in terms of how to control 
these kinds of structures. Um, and so I am working with these kinds of flexible structures that are spanning uh, a wide range of Reynolds numbers and their response uh, to the forces that are being applied to them. I think one of the things that we're seeing is, is that it's important that we distinguish between what is passive and what is active. For example, you brought up the, the nanomotor control of the flagellum. Um, and so in the viscous regime, uh, the way that we like to think about it is you can't glide, right? If I stop pushing on the fluid, I stop moving. And so in a way, it's a little bit easier to do feed forward control in that in that context because you're not really experiencing much pushback. Um, well, you are, but it's but it's a little bit different than if you have a floppy propulsor that has inertia, right? And then you have a lot more to worry about. Um, so I think that would be a challenge if you're thinking about kind of the control architecture of something like that and in terms of integrating that with the the multi-scale nature of the fluid flow. So um, short answer, but I think there's quite a lot of, of stuff to unpack and happy to kind of expand into a broader discussion. Thank you, Margaret. I always like this hierarchical control at multiple length scales and multiple signals. So that is very attractive. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so in terms of the, the food question, um, so um, I would say for, for handling food, right? So the original source of funding for um, at least the, the latter project, the one with the Mario demonstration, um, that was funded in terms of making kind of next generation soft prosthetics um, that allow people to have a higher degree of function, but you know, for cheaper to fabricate and, and so forth um, with enhanced portability. And so the idea was, was that, you know, similar to other soft robotic systems, that the ability, so the, the fingers that we use, actually, we didn't want them to be too flexible because I wanted them to be able to press the buttons of the Nintendo, right? But um, there are other systems where, where the entire finger would be made of that flexible material to be able to kind of grasp that around complex objects or delicate objects um, with one, being able to actually successfully grip them uh, and two, not breaking them. Uh, those are some of the inherent benefits of, of soft robotics that um, the hope was to be able to eventually execute that. But right now we, we we just finished that particular paper and it's it's under review, so we'll, we'll see how that goes for next steps. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to open it to everybody. Yes, yeah, so I have a question for Margaret. So for the high speed flows, Margaret, do you have a turbulence level at which uh, these devices, even for the gliding mechanism, uh, control becomes a challenge? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure if you're finished with your question. I lost your audio for a second. Okay. Yeah. So I was I was just trying to understand. Do you have a level of turbulence uh, defined for these problems where the gliding mechanism will not work for high speed flow? Especially I because think... right now we are talking about gliding vehicles for hypersonics, and that's the biggest concern we have, even for high altitude, very low free stream turbulence level. That gliding is a challenging in those environments. Okay, I think I see what you mean. Yeah, I think um, there's there's somewhat of a of a of a ambiguity about the way we define gliding. I think in terms of what is a glider, and what I found in terms of trying to liaise between the biological and the engineering community is that there are very different um, uses of terminology. Right, we would say a glider is exactly what you're talking about, um, but in terms of a, a gliding animal, I think for me that would be any animal that that is able to use inertia as a significant component of its propulsive force generation, right? So uh, the animals that I'm studying, for example, when they beat their appendage, the flow continues to move after the beat is done, right? And to me, that's almost kind of, when I'm saying gliding, that's kind of what I mean. So not quite the same as an autonomous vehicle glider, uh, but again, issues of control in terms of what's the most effective way to, for uh, for a glider or an animal perturbation rejection. And I'm imagining that's a big problem uh, in terms of the systems that you work with. All right, you have a turbulent gust and, and how you make your um, device or your vehicle robust to that uh, in terms of being able to continue on its, on its prescribed path. Um, and so I don't necessarily have an answer in terms of a hard cutoff, uh, for example, for a particular Reynolds number at which this would be a hard problem versus not a hard problem. Uh, I think it's very case dependent. Um, but I do agree that it's an interesting problem. Um, I think the most important thing that we can do here is kind of maintain clear communication lines about um, what means what, right? So in uh, the swimming world, uh, a high Reynolds number would be 
you know, a few thousand. That would be high enough to consider it a high Reynolds number swimmer. And of course, in the aerial world, that's that's not true. That's a that's a low a lower Reynolds number. Um, and so I think there's quite a lot of communication to be done there. Um, that's a little bit of a sidestep to your question, but we can clarify further if you wish. Um, I'm good. Thank you. We do have a question for you in the chat. No. Yes, I just saw it. How would the fluid structure change when uh, the fluids are non Newtonian? Oh my gosh. I mean, that's a great question. I, I think it would depend on the fluid. Um, I think if you had, um, you know, depending on whether the, the fluid was um, shear, shear thinning, shear thickening, viscoplastic, there's so many variations that I think that would be very context dependent as well. Um, so, uh, but uh, I think there are obviously some some applications. There are quite a lot of biological fluids that are not Newtonian. You can think about blood or mucus. Uh, and of course, when you think about cilia, when we think about ciliary fluid dynamics, one of the biggest reasons we care about cilia is because of their role in human health, right? And ciliopathic diseases and, and so on and so forth. Um, and often you have cilia that are transporting a mucus layer uh, and that mucus is not Newtonian. Um, and I think that uh, Professor Alexeyev, who is also on this call, might be a better person to answer that particular question, uh, given the recent paper that, that his, uh, his group and his collaborators just put out. Um, but yeah, I think um, in terms of the okay, clarifying the fluid structure interaction, um, again, I, you know, that's a good question. We haven't thought too much about it. We've been focused on the aquatic organisms, which are primarily the fluid we're working with is water. Um, so I do think it's a relevant question. Um, but again, I think uh, that's a perhaps a, a more in-depth and, and context-dependent, case-dependent question. So Ryan, do you want to take Mark's question first and then we can go to Margaret? Well, there's a, there's a lot there. You can go to the last paragraph. So. I'll take the yeah, last paragraph we can handle. Um, so, so the question is, um, you know, if we have thoughts or advice on how engineers, designers, or algorithms can, might, or should consider the multi-scale design of the geometry of material to actually achieve a desired behavior or effect. Um, I mean, so the main problem I would say for the materials that, that I use and at these scales is that the fabrication process has such a significant um, impact on the mechanical properties and the way that it behaves more than you know, one would expect from, from a lot of these kind of processes. So um, how many la layers you divide a part up, um, the way that we handle hatching, the direction of the hatching, um, how is the laser power that day, how old is the photoresist that you're using, these are all things that can actually have an impact on functionality. Um, and so you know, I would say, at least in terms of, of some of the technologies that I discussed, there's a lot of just fundamental research that's currently needed on just being able to understand like the process performance relationships um, for additive manufacturing um, to even begin to step towards, you know, modeling these well to get to some of those um, larger questions that you're asking. Um, yeah, I think, I think I would add to that. Uh, I think we can take a lot of lessons here from computational fluid dynamics which has to do quite a lot of thinking about multi-scaled phenomena and, and has to deal with a lot of really practical limitations dealing with the, the widespread of scales. Uh, and you see a lot of, I think the general term for it is upscaling um, or in turbulence modeling, we would call this closure models. Um, because not only do you have to think about how your key parameters vary across scales, you have to think about how what's happening at one scale is affecting what's happening at another scale. So you can't just think about, okay, well, how does, for example, uh, propulsive force generation scale, right? Because I'm, I'm thinking about, okay, how does my thrust generation scale across, you know, a wide range of Reynolds numbers? Well, how does my drag scale across a wide range of Reynolds numbers? And, and maybe I can't treat those independently. In fact, it's very likely that I can't. Uh, and so we have interaction effects as well. Um, and so when we think about uh, coming back to turbulence, uh, we have to parameterize the effects sometimes of the small scales on the large scales so that we don't have this immense, immensely complex problem of, of computing accurate flow at all of the scales, the problem. Uh, and so I think maybe that might be a useful lens through which we can look at other questions that exhibit this multi-scale nature. 
uh, and say, okay, well, in the abstract, maybe the first thing we think about is how does this scale affect this scale? If I'm interested in something that's going on at this scale, I need to think about all the ways in which phenomena that are going on at this scale and all the ways that phenomena that are going on at this scale might affect this scale and include that in kind of my design process. So, uh, Devish, can I ask a follow-up question to Margaret? Yes, go ahead, Ajay. Thank you. So, Margaret, what you just said is where actually I reached quite a few years before and I just started looking at convergence in the biology because it is really the convergence of three things, lens scales, signals, and materials and processes. And they are so intimately converged. So what you're talking about the lens scale and their behavior, but when the species is controlling that, the neurological or chemical signals in that species are also simultaneously being modulated. And so they're sensing, actuating, and demonstrating the macroscopic behavior at the same time. And I found this a beautiful example, and this all look aesthetically beautiful. I, mean, I was in the Chicago Museum, and you see uh, these uh, ocean animals, they just look adorable. So I just wanted to connect the dots of convergence to biology. But uh, yeah. I, I, I like... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll add on to that, that often in the biological systems, you have the, uh, a sensor and an actuator that are the same, right? You have uh, the same uh, appendage performing multiple functions, perhaps, uh, and then you have to deal with the multifactorial optimization problem. Uh, and, and one thing that I often see in, in terms of this interface between engineers and biologists is the necessity to avoid strict copying, right? Let's say I want to build a robot based on my uh, tinafore, right? And I want it to swim in an agile way. Well, if I just try to really copy everything about my animal, then I'm also copying over a lot of things that, that I might not need, right? Like I might not need to capture prey and escape from predators uh, and things like that, even though that's that's a, a pretty pretty important uh, thing for the animal to be, to be thinking about. Um, and so I think, I've, I've been heartened to see the engineering community kind of moving away from this almost kind of nature worshiping way of saying, okay, evolution is, is nature's engineer and this is an optimization project because the reality is that evolution doesn't optimize per se. Evolution says good enough, right? Good enough to exist and, and beat my nearest competitor. Uh, and so when we think about bioinspired design, we need to think about the basic physical principles that we can learn from the natural system rather than kind of copying over a whole suite of parameters that might be uh, uh, you know, designed or optimized or whatever you want to say for, for um, behaviors that we, we don't really need or want to pursue. Um, and so, uh, yeah. I know we're almost close to five o'clock, so I'd like to go ahead and thank first Ajay. Thank you very much for having to be moderator and to Margaret and Ryan, uh, excellent presentation. And just for everyone, these are recorded and it will be posted on the Frontier site. Uh, feel free to pass, it to pass on to students who might want to watch it later. I'll just try to share one and give out. Uh, do join us next week. Uh, we do have uh, exciting uh, seminar is uh, focused on system reliability and control. And the two speakers are going to be Katrina Gotts from uh, University of Maryland again. And we're going to have from Purdue Nira Chan. going to be moderated by Mark Castello, chairing of the aerospace engineering knowing controls here. With that, I'd like to thank everyone. If you want to stay on and uh, interact more with uh, Ajay and the speaker, feel free to hang on. You can unmute your mic and video and can interact. Uh, once Ben stops the uh, recording, you can open your uh, bottle of wine or whichever you want to drink. It's all happy. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you to all the speakers and organizers. Organizers, a very nice job. Uh, this is very inspiring. Thank you. Yeah.